Hello, and welcome to The Resilient Investor with me, David Stevenson. As we do in each episode, we try and walk our way through an asset class or a kind of investment strategy or an idea and try to get a little bit under the skin of it and try and understand why, if you're investing, certainly at a kind of earlier stage in your investing career, you'd look at it. And, and over the last couple of episodes, we've been spending a lot more time talking about funds and we've been talking a lot more with investment trusts. Um, and investment trusts and funds generally, I think, I would say this because I'm on the board of a few investment trusts, uh, are quite an efficient and quite a, a cost-effective way of getting access quite often to difficult to access alternative areas that you couldn't access, say, through, a, I don't know, a unit trust or something like that. Investment trusts are really good for that kind of thing. Um, and, and the other thing which we've already explored in, in previous episodes is there's this whole growth of kind of alternative assets. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit more detail. Um, because if you can imagine, in, in the world out there at the moment, you, you sort of got your, your basic choices are things like equities, stocks and shares, bonds, sort of understand that. That's government securities or corporate bonds, um, might be loans. And then there's kind of alternatives like commodities. But bridging this kind of divide are things called private assets or private markets. Um, and private assets, private markets, is actually quite a broad spectrum, just like Bonds is a very broad spectrum. Equities is a very broad spectrum. Private assets is a broad spectrum. It includes everything from private equity, which probably a lot of you heard about. I think we talked about that in previous episodes. Um, goes down to private debt and private credit and, and infrastructure assets as well get, it, get in there. So it's quite a broad spectrum. And, and in this episode, we are going to focus a bit more on the private assets. And we are going to talk a little bit more about the private equity bit of it, because that's by and large the biggest bit of the private assets jigsaw or spectrum, you could say. And we're going to talk about this with uh, with Colin Walsh, who's the portfolio manager at the ICG Enterprise Trust. Trust. Nice to see you, Colin. Thank you, Dave. Um, now, let's just get the kind of the, the basics out of the way first. By and large, you invest in private equity. Correct. And we talk a lot about spectrums here and kind of ranges of things. So there's a spectrum of private assets. And there's also a spectrum within private equity, isn't there? That's right. And um, there, this ranges from venture capital, which is sort of earlier stages of firms. It goes up to kind of mid-stage companies, kind of mid-cap companies, and then there's buyout companies. And just talk me through the spectrum of private equity, because it's quite a broad spectrum, yeah. isn't it? Well, first of all, I think we are, as an industry... Very, very guilty of making it sound tremendously complicated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, lots um, we, of jargon. And lots acronyms. of jargon. We throw around buyouts and LPs yeah, yeah, and GPs. Yeah, yeah. So I'll try and steer away from that. Good. Keep it nice and simple for a, uh, just if an ordinary, basic beginner yeah. investor trying to work out yeah. why they should have access to private assets. Absolutely. So, well, first of all, private private equity has the same range of investment styles, the same range of investment opportunities as public equity. Yeah. I mean, within the public equity market, you have very solid companies that have been around for hundreds of years. Kind of what we call kind of boring defensive. Dividend champions. Dividend champions, yeah. yeah. You know, they pay a nice regular dividend check. And then you have IPOs of... Far oh, sexy companies. Yeah, like Raspberry Pi or, you know, yeah. you have this whole range, this whole gamut within public markets. And you have the same thing within the private markets as well. So you referenced that spectrum all the way from venture capital, growth equity, um, things like distressed investment, and what I spend my time looking at are, again, I'm going to be guilty of a little bit of jargon. Yeah, go for it, go for it. But buyouts. Buyouts. Um, what's a buyout? Well, buyout, we're talking about resilient. Um, we like that, resilient investment, yeah. Cash generative, EBITDA yep. positive. So profitable companies. Yeah. Typically that are market leaders, might be in quite a small niche of the economy. Yeah. That are market leaders um, that are privately held. And the benefit of that for, for these kinds of companies is that they're able to grow away from the you know some great advantages to public to the public model, but one of the downsides sometimes is that companies are really subject to that quarterly earnings pressure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Every quarter, you've, what we mean by that, listener, is that you've got to kind of increase your earnings per share every quarter, and the analysts put out their numbers, and and if you don't hit their estimates, there's lots of disappointment or or surprises. And you can get punished or or rewarded either way. And a lot of time is spent, you know, is spent on thinking about that, you know, from the senior management of these companies. Mm. 
And whilst the, you know, obviously there's tremendous advantages for investors in terms of transparency and so forth, sometimes that can have adverse consequences. Mm. It takes companies away from focusing on their long term growth. So we think one of the great benefits of investing in private equity is you benefit from the that model. So it's very focused on driving operational improvements in a company. Now that might not necessarily manifest itself in their earnings in a particular quarter, but you're building the foundations for the long-term growth of a company. And how long would you invest in a company like this for? We'll talk a bit more specifics of kind of company. Yeah. Well, it, it depends, and you would expect me to say that, but typically... Um, the companies are held for somewhere between four to six years. Mm-hmm. Now, it might be longer, and there might be really good reasons to hold a really good company for longer. I mean, quite frankly, if something keeps growing, you might want just to keep it to benefit from that growth. But a typical hold period is around four to six years. And that's enough time for the manager to be able to make material improvements to the company that helps it to grow. So give me, let's talk, give me practical examples of the kinds of companies. So what kind of, how much, how, what might their sales be? Are they profitable, you've mentioned? Yeah. What kind of size are they? What kind of industries are they in? Where are they? Give me some examples. Okay, so we are generalist investors. So what I do is we look across different sectors of the economy. And you also have different managers, and we'll come back to that a little bit later, listen, because it's all about how do you pick different managers as kind of fund-to-fund approach. But we'll we'll park that for now. Yeah, so we... talk about companies. So so the the underlying companies that you end up with, as I say, we're looking for things that are cash generative, that are um, growing, of course. And and typically what we like to see are companies that have a really resilient business model. Mm -hmm. But really importantly, companies that are able to grow, even you know that even during difficult economic environments, more volatile environments. So, what do we mean by that? Well, we look for companies that have strong underlying. Now, we call them structural growth trends. So these are things like, and, they, and there's a whole variety of different trends that you can see in different parts of the economy. So, for example, cloud-based computing. Yes. Yeah. So that's one thing where you have a business which historically software was something you bought up front yep. and then every so often you would change it. Yeah. Whereas now, and we all do this with our, you know, when you buy Microsoft products. I'd like to say Office 365 is and all on the cloud. And it's a subscription. You don't just buy the, back in the day you'd buy the disks and yeah, yeah. five years later you might buy some new disks. Still got a few of them sitting at home. Yeah, yeah. same. I never know where yeah, to what put to them. do with them. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I should keep them, but yeah, yeah, exactly. realistically. Yeah, no, you're never going to get yeah. anything for them, yeah. But um, now it's a subscription. And that's true in more specialised types of software as well. And that's a long-term trend. It was actually expedited by um, the lockdown period, when obviously yeah, when we were all work working home. remotely, having software in the cloud made a lot of sense. What it means is that the business model all of a sudden becomes much more about recurring revenue. Mm-hmm. So we like investing. We've invested in a number of different software companies. Now, what do we like about that? Well, the revenue is recurring. It's growing as companies are trying to become more efficient. They're increasingly looking to software. Um, But also, um, software is a very small proportion of of most companies' cost base. Mm -hmm. So it means that when we have inflation, they have the ability to be able to pass on their the the increase in their cost base, they can pass on to their customers, which means that they're able to keep their margins um, and, and sustain their growth. Uh, and just going back to my other question, how big would these companies t- sure. be? Would they be turning over hundreds of millions, billions, tens of millions? So we have a wide range, but typically um, the their operating profits or EBITDA would be somewhere between 10 and 100 million pounds, yeah. approximately. We have some bigger, some smaller. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but when you think about that in terms of the size of the company, and this is probably another really interesting point to make, when you think about it in terms of the size of the company, this is also a way of accessing a particular type of company that's actually quite rare in the public markets. So companies, we talk about enterprise value, the total value of the company. And that includes the debt. That and right? includes the debt. And that's, but that's typically um, up to two billion. Now, of course, big amount of money. Yeah. But actually, by the standards of listed markets, yeah, that's, that's a reasonably small cost, company. I say that's, that's sort of smaller end of mid cap, isn't it? So again... We can complicate this a lot, but I think one of the benefits of owning private equity, it's not just that model I outlined, which focuses on long-term growth. It's also the ability to access growing, profitable companies 
in the kind of engine room of the economy, if you like. So, any other sets of that? You've mentioned cloud, anything else? Yeah, so just thinking about some of our larger exposures that we have in our portfolio, um, it varies quite a bit. So our, one of our largest companies provides fire protection services. Oh, yeah, yeah. So quite a, you know. Yeah, essential. It's very essential, exactly. It's mandated yeah. by regulation. Yeah, we've got much choice, yeah. Yeah, so you, and, and that's, you know, so you build, say you have an airport. Now your airport obviously needs to have a fire protection system. Mm-hmm. The, the demand for that doesn't depend on the volume of flights. Mm. So even during the COVID pandemic, commercial aviation might well have been down 95% as we were all stuck at home. Um, but you still need it, as long as the airport was operating, yeah. it still needed to have a fire protection system. And not only that, this company also gets to service those components oh, as right. well. So yeah. they have to be checked every so often. I mean, we all see on the side of the fire extinguishers, the label. Yeah, 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 it's a slightly more sophisticated version of that. But again, all of these, um, the demand for these services is underpinned by regulation. And the global demand is increasing as increasingly emerging markets also adopt that regulation as well. There's a company that benefits from just the general growth in things like infrastructure, so shopping centres, airports, and so on. But it also has this embedded base that it services, creating very dependable and recurring revenue stream. And other other things you've brought into? Yeah, so loads of things. Um, we have um, a big investment in um, a business, European Camping Group, right. that um, operates under the Eurocamp brand, oh, which is... Any parent knows that. Yes. Yeah. Um, which provides um, very high quality... Way to look after your kids on holiday and yeah. pass them off to... And, you know, it's a very <laughs> nice... Keep them occupied for a couple of weeks. Very nice. Yeah. I think people's perceptions of, of, of what holiday parks look like, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, really... Um, and we're and back. By the, and by the way, not cheap. I mean, quite good, good, very good quality, but not, 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 not. It's not pitching a tent in the side of a field with a couple of cows. But I think, I think, Dave, very good value. Very, very good value. value. <laughs> um, so no, so um, and that's a business which yeah, yeah. Um, actually is substantially. Most of the, the um, sites are based in France. Yeah, but a lot in France. Yeah. But most of the customers come from overseas, yeah. and actually, Britain lots is the of, is the largest Brits. market. Yeah, yeah, lots of Brits. Okay, so going back to something I mentioned, you say buyout, buyout from whom? Right, so that can be um, from multiple different sources, but typically we think of it as either from another financial, yep. or it's another private equity firm, yep. or um, a private sale, and that could be from the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur, the yeah. founder of the business, or family. Um, so yes, yeah, so or or it could be um, from the public markets as well. Oh, you could buy a company from the public markets, yeah, and, and take we've it private. And we've seen recently, I think there's been quite a bit of press coverage yeah. about UK stocks being yeah cheap. Jeep and yeah. some private equity firms have spotted that and come in. Absolutely. Yeah. And where? I mean, you are you exclusively European, American, British? What's, yeah. How does it feel? What's what's? I mean, because because let's be honest, private equity, like many things, it's always sounds a bit American. You know, you can almost yeah. hear that American private equity. You know, <laughs> that's it for less than Texas. Um, um, but I mean, is it mostly American or is it a British you know, European? What's the mix in the industry generally? So I would say. The world's largest private equity market is unsurprisingly the US. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's probably an underdeveloped asset class in some of the emerging economies, yeah, so yeah, India yeah, and China. So, yeah. And the second biggest market is, if you add all of Europe together, yeah. including the UK, um, then that's, and we think of it as being, in terms of the market opportunity, roughly 50-50 okay. between the Europe. US and Europe. Now, for us, there are absolutely... Really, there are good opportunities in other parts of the world outside of North America and Europe. But the way we in particular look at the market, we tend to, we're just focusing on those two large markets. We have, have a lot of depth of experience, very high quality managers. But you also have, we call it the sort of ecosystem where you have legal systems that support the asset class. Um, you have depths of talent. Um, so we tend to think, we tend to focus our fire on those two markets where we think you have the deepest kind of market opportunity. Um, and before I just talk about this fund to fund approach, one of the things, I mean, you'll have anticipated this, lots of people always talk about private equity as the, the, the bogeyman of debt. Yeah. Um, and they think, oh, they always think about leverage buyouts. Actually, yeah. LBOs, that's a yes. terrible acronym that's crept in and everybody always thinks about. And, and they, I, thought, and, I thought it was my job to dispense the acronyms. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I've now brought an acronym into the conversation and we're going to have to kill it. Um, but they talk about uh, leverage buyouts and you hear always talk about yeah. lots of debt. Is there lots of debt involved? 
Um, so debt is an important part of the private equity model, yeah. and it and it does help to generate some of the return. But it, increasingly, it's not. We our own approach is to invest in, in managers that use the right amount of debt, and that's mm-hmm. not the maximum amount of debt. Mm-hmm. Um, these are businesses that have strong recurring revenues. So their ability to be able to repay debt is greater all else equal than the average company that's worth your, your annual money. subscriptions for your software. Exactly. And if that software has, if the underlying demand for that software is very stable and growing, then what happens over time is that you reduce your debt, you pay it off. Yeah. Um, so we tend to invest in managers that are relatively cautious, that view it as, as one element of the return, but actually they're typically much more focused on those operational improvements in terms of driving driving the return. So our average level of debt is below the market average. And as I say, the kinds of managers that we back, they've been through lots of different cycles. They know the pitfalls um, of having too much, again, we call it leverage, um, but having too much debt or leverage. Okay, now you've, you've mentioned managers, I mentioned fund of funds. Now, we, again, we've talked about private equity in the past on here, but you, you're different from our previous conversations because you've got different managers, although you also manage your, your, a, a print, some of your own capital yourself. Yes. So talk me through a hat. So effectively, what you're trying to do, I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. is trying to pick the best managers in the best geographies, in the best sectors with the rest of businesses. Yes. So how does, how does that, that fund manager selection process work? So in reality, you're a, a fund of fund with also a separate pool of money you directly manage. Is that right? Yes. So, how, so we, I, I work at um, a company called ICG. It's a FTSE 100 company. Um, we are an alternatives asset manager. In other words, based, you know, from your introduction, we invest across the private markets. And you do quite a lot of debt, actually. Nice. We do quite a lot of debt. Yeah, exactly. And um, we invest in some of those strategies yeah. that ICG offers. Mm-hmm. Um, about thirty percent of the portfolio, okay. and the other seventy percent. So thirty percent in house. So yeah, thirty percent in house. Um, but all in strategies that are very aligned with what we're looking for. Okay. We never invest in anything just because it's an ICG fund. Yeah. These are all things that really fit squarely into what we're looking for. We're looking, I think you, you summarised it perfectly, we're looking for the best managers. Now, but what do we mean by the best? Because everyone's got a different mm. version of what good looks like. But, you know, what is important for us, I would say there's three factors. We're looking for, we really believe in the power of experience. So you mentioned about um, debt Mm. and we've talked about operational improvements. Mm. These are all things, your ability to manage these things improves with experience. Mm. And it's not just the experience of the individuals, there's a kind of institutional experience as well. So we like backing managers that have been around for a few different cycles. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And what that means is that even during- Through through recessions and- Yeah. yeah. And every period of volatility, every recession, or you know, things like the COVID pandemic, they're all different. They're never the same. But what there are some commonalities with how you deal with them. And so, you know, candidly, we, nobody had ever been through anything, you know, nobody alive today had been through anything like the COVID pandemic. But our managers just knew what buttons to press, what levers to pull to be able to manage through that crisis. Mm-hmm. We had investments in things like education, mm-hmm schools business where nobody had assumed that all these early years education Mm. sites would be closed at the same time. Mm. But our managers instinctively knew what to do. So that experience is super important. The next thing I would say is consistency. So the way we like to invest, you know, in our industry, you you can hear about these, you know, very high headline returns, but it's not much good to us if they're followed by terrible performance. We like backing managers that are able through cycles to generate very strong, but also very consistent returns. So you're not getting these massive ups and downs. And, it, and you know, we it, the simple maths of this is if you're consistent and you don't get those drawdowns, then yeah. you, know, you, 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 ma- you optimize your returns over time. Um, and I would also say the final strand when we look at a manager is, and this might sound very simplified, but are they investing in the kinds of companies that I've just talked yeah, about? Yeah. You know, uh, sometimes there's a temptation, what we call it strategy drift, when a manager might decide to do something wild, a bit mm. different. Um, we we like we don't like managers that, that are wild. 
we like managers that sort of stick to their knitting. So what, um, what kind of managers, I mean, what names have you got? Um, portfolio yeah and this thing that these are big names in private equity but yeah. i'd be surprised if for many people they're big household names yeah um so we invest in the u.s with managers and again if you're a private equity geek these names will be well known to you but new mountain capital jordan company um i'm not oak hill <laughs> and and you know so, so actually relatively um not very well known about so they're, they're not the really very famous because lots of lots of people have heard of very famous yes. names like well not lots the carlisle and the blackstone yeah and you know all these crowds so it's not that i'm, I'm i always hesitate when i say these no. words top tier because top tier yeah. is simply the fact that they're just very big yeah uh, so we, we would say we invest in the top tier managers in terms of performance yeah but not messy not they, necessarily in terms of size yeah maybe some of them are quite big quite big they are quite big. Um, in Europe, the names are people like Sinvan, yeah. HG Capital. Who are reasonably well known, actually. Reasonably well known. And maybe more so in, in the UK because yeah. when you pick up the financial, you know, when you look at the financial well, pages HG's for a press. Got their investment yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, oh, okay. So, um, and, um, and where do you think, just to sort of close the conversation off, um, where do you think we are in the cycle? Because PE goes through lots of yeah. cycles. All look, listen. All investments go through cycles. Economies go through cycles. Investments go through cycles. We're currently going through the Nvidia cycle, um, the, <laughs> the AI, everything AI related cycle, um, and then usually at some point there's an enormous blow up. Yeah, and yeah. things fall in value. I mean that's that's absolutely how the weather markets work. Well, and, and PE has had probably has had a tough old few years. Yeah. Venture capital's had an even tougher few years and arguably is only just recovering from it. Where are we in the private equity cycle? Where, 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 what's your sense, gut feeling, where we are at the moment? Have we hit bottom? Have we, are we coming off the bottom? Uh, where, where, I mean, what's yeah. your sense? So I would say, I mean, I mentioned that every period of volatility, every recession, it's always different. And I think throughout my career, I think this one is different as well. Mm. And I think it's been driven by, we've obviously had this very unusual periods, which mm. for many of us, I think for many, many of us became normal. But if, when you look at economic history, having interest rates near zero is yeah. absolutely not I, normal. I was going to ask about yeah. the end, you know, higher rates for yeah. longer. You hear this talked about yeah. a lot. Yeah. And I, so I would say that we're going through a period of adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you think about, you know, it's been a very good run yeah. uh, since the end of the global financial crisis, the, the industry has performed very well. It's been a benign environment. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that, you know, I think at the, in the current market, what, what we've seen as interest rates rose was activity fell away slightly in our markets. So that meant fewer new deals and fewer realizations. I always think of it like a machine and the cogs just move a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. um, so we're in a period where we've had this low, this low activity, these low activity levels driven by that sudden change as people mm. sort of adjust and recalibrate uh, and and appraise what they you know what their where their position is. Um, I think at the moment I feel that there are some early signs of recovery in that activity. Okay, I think we've got used to the idea of having slightly higher rates. I think we feel reasonably good because you know candidly over the last you know the, prior to the interest rates to, to interest rates rising, everything was doing really well. Yeah. you know, fueled yeah, by these low right, rates. Yeah. I would. I think that relatively, you know, the the particular part of the market we invest in, will will do will do pretty well in comparison to things like venture capital because they're Which is still having a tough time. Yeah, because because obviously, with higher rates, um, that changes the way you think about valuations mm. of, of more speculative companies, um, and also the activity levels in that part of the market really slow down. So. Um, Are you seeing more deals in some of the underlying companies you're seeing? Are there more takeouts, more takeovers? Um, I think relative. I think relative to last year, there's been a bit of a pickup. Yeah. But we're not seeing the kind of heady levels yeah, of yeah. deal activity that perhaps we saw in 2021. Yeah. So we're not we're not back to normal yet. No. Um, but but I think what we're seeing in terms of the operational performance of the companies, when you take a step back from the kind of the levels of activity in the market the kinds of companies we invest in because they're not, they, they haven't got a very um, cyclical business model. They're continuing to perform quite well in terms of their revenue and earnings okay. growth. And lastly, I, I, at the very beginning, I talked about investment trusts. Yeah. And you are an investment trust. Yeah. Um, 
And um, one of the disadvantages of investor is yeah. they can trade at a discount, yeah. which is, I mean, it's an advantage as well because it means you can pick up good quality stuff cheap. Yeah. But what's your discount at the moment? So it's roughly 35%. Which is not as bad as some, but it's yeah. still, you know, it's bigger than you want it to be, I imagine. Yeah. So what, what's your sense? Uh, and and that, I, don't, I know it does unnerve some yeah. investors. They think, oh, crikey Moses, yeah. yeah. Uh, and again, to repeat, pretty much all of this at private equity funds are trading at reasonably big discounts. Yep. What do you think is going to change that? Or, or do you think it ever will change? Ooh, well, I hope it does. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it will. Yeah. And I think there are very, everyone, I think, I'm sure people you speak to as yeah, well. Exactly. We'd never be likely to change. And it's got a different pet theory as to what yeah. the reason for it is. I think... Um, what can you do? What can people? What can what can fund managers and portfolio managers like you do to change it? I, can yeah. you do lots of buyouts, lots of deals. I mean, what 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 do you yeah. think is going to change? What's the catalyst? So I think okay, the catalyst. I think there's a few things we can do, and there's yeah. a few things that come from the outside market. Yeah. The things we can do, I think, is just to keep executing our strategy, right, um, and just prove that it works. Yep. I think um, we can try. You know, we've tried to control our cost base. Yep reduced our fees, okay. we've assumed more costs, so we've taken on board some of the costs the vehicle used to, the investment trust used to pay. So they're things we can control. And we can also try and better align what the shareholder experience is when they buy the shares yep. to how our portfolio performs. And we do, and that's through things like um, share buybacks. Yeah. So obviously at a 35% discount, we think our portfolio is, looks, yeah, is very attractive. A sensible idea to buy some shares. And our board, um, working with our board, we've instituted um, a, 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 we've got two types of buyback. So we've got a, what we call an opportunistic buyback, which seeks to take out any large okay. on-field demand in the market. And also um, a, a, an everyday buyback, if you like, that yeah. sort of, that, that absorbs some of the day-to-day -day fluctuations in yeah. demand. Um, and they're really aimed at, um, trying to correct some of the anomalies in the in the underlying market for our stocks, so we can do that. The other thing is doing things like this, you know, mm -hmm. spreading the word more, being more yeah, transparent. Exactly. We've broadened the range of disclosure, so when you look at our accounts now, we don't just tell you about a small sample size. Well, of the I, must, I was going to say, pretty much all the private equity, listed private equity funds, their reporting accounts are immensely better than they used to be. And actually, in my humble opinion, I I judge for the Association of Investment Companies. Private equity funds, by and large, have the best reporting accounts out there because, they, as you said, they they go into enormous detail yeah. now, and you go look at the profiles of all the companies. So, I, I think you've all done collectively much better on that. Well, thank you, and I think I think it has absolutely. So, I've been um, helping to manage the vehicle I work on, ICG Enterprise, for the last fourteen years, and um, it's definitely become much more of a focus yeah. trying to because I think the the thing is it is a um, we we want investors to fully understand mm. what we get to see every day and just impart that better, um, that it is a really attractive model. There's some really good companies. Um, I, I think one of the things I love about my job is the is the breadth of business models and types of business that mm. you see. And different managers. And different managers and different approaches. And, you know, we've got some managers that are specialists in um, what they call buy and build. So buying a platform and then adding on new companies to that platform. Mm. We've got some companies that, some managers rather, that really focus on operational improvement, improving right. the efficiency of factories. And there's lots of different ways and different specialisms. Um, and, I, and I think um, to the extent we can get that across to the retail investor, I'm hopeful that over time, it doesn't, can't, won't No, it's not going to quickly. I mean, finally, the one thing I would say too is, I think as activity levels pick up, Perhaps people are nervous because of the change in interest rates, because of some of the market changes. But I think as activity levels pick up um, and normal service is resumed, you know, we're very confident that the portfolio is well valued at the moment. We have a long track record of when things are realised, they get realised at consistent uplifts the previous carrying value. So we think as those activity levels pick up, yeah, it's also going to be a potential catalyst. Yeah, sure. It sort of proves to people um, you know, that... Um, that the navs are, are well founded. That the, net, that the share price will catch up with the NAS. Yeah. Today. Well, right, Cal Cullen Walsh, thank you very much from the ICG Enterprise Trust. Um, hopefully, now after a couple of resilient investors on the subject of private equity, you've got a better understanding of how these alternative assets work, how private assets work, the private markets work, and um, 
Well, I hope good luck in difficult markets. Who the hell knows what's going to happen over the next few weeks? All these elections coming up. I wonder what the results will be. Anyway, Colin, thank you very much. Thank you.